minor or short pieces, as you know, to get it sort of going and then move on to the main, the main topic of discussion <coughs> as time passes. So uh, today what I want to do is point out uh, to you in your text a few poems that you might want to read on your own, some of the major pieces of uh, Leaves of Grass. After I've done that, I'll return to Song of Myself and we'll do as much of it as we can this afternoon. So start with uh, me by looking at the table of contents in your Leaves of Grass. Uh, there's no use to you having to dig out the, the gems or the jewels or the more important ones on your own. If you open it up, you'll see it starts out with uh, inscriptions, which I read some of to you a couple of weeks ago. On uh, page 15, uh, sorry, you don't have the same text. At the end of the inscriptions, you'll see two uh, major poems appearing. One is starting from Pomenach, and that's followed by Song of Myself. The poem we're doing now, Song of Myself is the um, is the masterpiece of Leaf of Grass, and it's got a very prominent position, as you can see, in the final structure of the, uh, the volume. If you look at, uh, uh, starting from Pomenach, it is sort of a, uh, the opposite of a coda, I suppose you'd call it, in music. It's a, a poem in which Whitman sets up, not a long, long poem, but it's not a short poem either. He sets up the, the nature of the singer, that, uh, the man that he is. Pomenach is uh, Long Island where he was born, and he was born in Long Island. And if you look at the first lines of starting from Pomenach, you'll get that sense of him telling you who he was, who he is, where he comes from. You might, I don't know what it is, 39 in your, in your text. What you catch is that this is in some ways the introduction to you of him. Inscri inscriptions are like small introductory tunes that say, here are some of the things I'm going to sing about. And starting from Pomenach, which appears right before the uh, Song of Myself, is him saying, here I am, starting from po fish-shaped Pomenach, where I was born, well-begotten, and raised by a perfect mother, after roaming many lands, lover of populous pavements, dweller in Manhattan, my city, or on southern savannas, or a soldier, camped or carrying my knapsack and gun, or a miner in California. He's telling you, in a sense, what traits he's going to carry into himself to offer to you as the poet, the singer of these songs, at the end of that opening stanza, you'll see him saying, with all of these things, the buffalo herds, the flowers, the mockingbirds, and heard that the, at dawn the unrivaled one, the hermit thrush from the swamp cedars, solitary, singing in the west, I strike up for the new world. Well, you know where that thrush is? It appears later on in, in lilacs, right? But what he's saying is, here I am, by myself, facing the new world, America. It's a nice, positive poem. Uh, not one of the best ones in the volume, but a good, a good poem. Then is Song of Myself. The next section, if you look back again at your table of contents, is Children of Adam. These are the poems in praise of men and women. And Calamus are the poems in praise of ma man and man. That is, uh, 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 it's a homosexual or, or man and man friendly love. So you get passionate love and then friendship, in a sense, in those two sections. At the end of Calamus, you'll see a series of poems that are the songs. These are uh, quite important in the structure of Leaves of Grass. They're the poems that are to take us around this nation. And he has some of the better poems in the volume. If you turn to uh, Song of the Open Road, uh, uh, about the second one in there, I don't have your same text. So somebody can holler it out. 136 to you. This is one of the one of the most uplifting of all the poems in the volume. It's where he says, let's find out what it is to be American. Let's get on the road, move along. Whitman is one of the first writers to get that crucial 20th century American quality of getting on the road, moving out. You don't have to be uh, someone like uh, like uh, Brodigan or uh, Ken Kesey <laughs> to do it. You can do it back in the 19th century. Afoot and lighthearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth, I ask not good fortune. I myself am good fortune. Henceforth, I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Done with indoor complaints, libraries, querulous criticisms, strong and content, I travel the open, open road. It's a very good song. 
and uh, really a nice poem to read uh, when you're feeling down and want to get out there and get the elbows loose from the restrictions of life. The poem after that is one of his most important poems, if you turn to that. I wanted to do it with you this uh, during this se uh, month's session, but we're not going to get to it. Well, maybe someday in the future. It's Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, which is a, uh, a marvelous, complex... 144. 144. It's his, the poem that comes to him in the setting of a man who's crossing the ferry, on the ferry where the Brooklyn Bridge is today. He went across the passage and then went back again and back again. And he saw in that phenomenon of the ferry crossing the image that he discovered for his use of what it is to be a human being, alive with other human beings, in the float of time. It's a subtle and complex and, and beautiful poem in many ways. I would hope that we would be able to uh, come to it someday. It's that feeling that comes from you as you look down in the water and see it passing as you pass over and find yourself caught in the, what the word is flux, the flux of time, which is what we are. We pass through, time goes on, and the image, the symbolic image of the ferry crossing the, crossing the river is very, very important. In Putnam. It's a major poem. You see how it begins. Flood tide below me, I see you face to face. Clouds of the west. Sun there, half an hour high, I see you also face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes, how curious you are to me. I told you last week that one of my great fantasies is that on the other side of that boat is Herman Melville also looking down and thinking about whales. <laughs> as he sees. They're on the same ferry, and Whitman's looking around, but he doesn't know that Melville's over there seeing something very different. On the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross, returning home, are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore, years hence, are more to me, are more in my meditations than you might suppose. And he's trying to do something very difficult, which is to get the people alive at that day. That is the multi- faceted quality of life, right? and at the same time recognize the continually endless quality of the river going its way to the sea, where even the weariest river finds its way to the sea sometime, and at the same time catch the sense of time that's involved with us. He's, he's thinking, think of the hundreds of people who will cross this ferry, who will stand here and see this sight, these ship's fires, right, these masts. People right there, people 100 years from now, you. Only he didn't know we'd be taking Brooklyn Bridge. Instead, the second stanza begins, the impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day, the simple, compact, well-joined scheme. Myself disintegrated, everyone disintegrated, yet part of the scheme. The similitudes of the past and those of the future, the glory like beads on my smallest sights and hearings on the walk in the street in the passage over here. The glorious strung like beads. Whitman has of any any great role in the poet that you get to see those glories that are like a like pearls around the neck, each one unique and yet combining to make beauty, right? to make nature, to make God in the world. Each one of us human beings sharing in that glory, which is what he believed. It's a, it's a very fine poem. It's a, unfortunately, we do not have time to, to go through it. Uh, there are some other good poems in here. If you're checking your uh, table of contents, uh, Song of the Broad Axe is a good one, and Song of the Redwood Tree is also. Uh, Pass over Birds of Passage. The, the book, Leaves of Grass, grew. Edition after edition, he added new sections, rearranged. Sea Drift is a very important path, uh, section. It is this section that has his famous poem, Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, which I would also like to do and will not do <laughs> because of time. Pass over by the roadside, which has small poems, some of which I read two weeks ago, and Drum Taps, which are poems dealing with the Civil War and Memories of President Lincoln, in which we'll find lilacs, which we read. As the editions pass, we come to some of the later post-Civil War poems, Autumn Rivulets, very nice pieces there. 
And at the end of that section, before Whispers of Heavenly Death, there are uh, three poems I'd like to mention to you before we go back to our uh, discussion on Song of Myself. They are Passage to India, Prayer of Columbus, and The Sleepers. So can you find those three poems? Yeah. Okay. What page is it on in your text? Passage to India. Okay, 321. I don't uh, believe Passage to India is as successful a poem as uh, what I wish it had been. But it's an important poem all the same to look at because it's here that he takes one of the major mechanical or uh, uh, modern contrivances mm -hmm. of the 19th century. It's a, 321? This poem is about... This poem is about the, uh, the completion of the Intercontinental Radio, uh, Railroad. Right? And the title comes from his contemplating that finally we've got what uh, Columbus was looking for. Right? That is when Columbus went west across the Atlantic, they were looking for India. And they got stuck because there was a continent in the way and we were created. And uh, 200 years later, 300 years later, we're still trying to find that passage to India. Uh, it's not there yet. But Whitman started thinking that in fact, now we have it. In the 1870s, when that golden spike came in, you can leave Portugal and cross the ocean and get on the train and get off in San Francisco and get on a boat and go to India. That is, this poem is about motion and time and space and connections. It doesn't work as well as some of the others, but it's got a very, very important kind of theme. The world has finally shrunk to that point, you see, where you can do it by going west. You can go to India. You don't have to go around South America to get there. So he's talking in this poem about what the 19th century has done for us, which has created the world that the 15th century was looking for. You see? It's, it's wonderful to have these achievements. Singing my days. Singing the great achievements of the present. Singing the strong, light works of engineers. Our modern wonders. The antique ponderous seven. I'll divide. It, right? The ponderous seven, do you know what they are? Sure. So they, they thought they right the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and, and the pyramids and the, the Colossus of Rhodes. Ah, right? Nothing. We have outdone the wonders of the world. We've made this. In the old world, the east, the Suez Canal, the new by its mighty railroad span. The e seas inlaid with eloquent, gentle wires. What's he talking about there? Cables. Transatlantic cables. This is the late 19th century. Yet first to sound and ever sound the cry with the old soul. Past. 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 Passage to India. Ultimately, he's going to ask us to go passage to more than India. Right? Don't be limited in your goal to go to India because it's the other, uh, it's the other extended effort that takes you beyond India to the meaning of India that's important for any poet, of course. So the next one is uh, one of uh, a couple of poems that are very unusual in some ways and very effective. I, two of my sort of favorite poems in Whitman. Again, we aren't going to get to this. We seldom see Whitman in a somber, overwhelmed state. But he's capable of doing it. And as a matter of principle, he believes it's something that we must come terms with. We have to accept all emotional states. And these two poems are poems that take us in a very strange world for Whitman. The Prayer of Columbus is particularly interesting because it deals with an image of Columbus, the old man, who's lived through his life, made his trips to the New World and gone back and now is dying in old age. And is asking himself, what did I do? <laughs> what com what's the outcome of, of my life? Because Columbus, too, was old and feeble and stopped passing the world over. Um, the image that we get of the great explorer out of something like Tennyson's Ulysses doesn't necessarily hold true in real life, does it? Ulysses goes out beyond the western gates, right? He's going to keep on sailing until some disaster takes him over. But Columbus didn't die like Nelson on the deck. He died in old age. A battered, wrecked old man thrown on this savage shore far, far from home, pent by the sea, in dark, rebellious brows, twelve dreary months, sore, stiff with many toils, sickened and nigh to death. I take
take my way along the island's edge, venting a heavy heart, too full of home. Happily, I may not live another day. I cannot rest, O oh God. I cannot eat or drink or sleep till I put forth myself, my prayer, once more to thee. Breathe, bathe myself once more in thee, commune with thee, report myself once more to thee. Well, you have to read that on your own, too. You sense right away this is very different. I like this poem a lot. It's very 20th century. So much of Whitman is, is strictly 19th century sort of uh, you know, the optimism. Right? And we don't have much of that left, but he was capable of getting our sense, too. And this is one of the uh, better poems of that type. It's also not very long. Finally, I'd like to recommend to you one of the uh, strangest poems of the 19th century. This is a dream vision called The Sleepers. Uh, I, I can never read it without being strongly affected of his, uh, by his ability to recreate the dream state. It also has a sense of coming together, trying to make human experience unified in its diversity. The image that makes the poem work, if you're interested in reading on your own, is that he's finding in sleep an experience that ties us all together, that unifying whatever it is that we in our diversity share we all sleep. And when you think of I Hear America singing her very carols I hear, where he's praising the songs of the diverse occupations that we have as Americans, this poem is the opposite. It's what all these people bring together in their commonness. At night, they go to bed, and they put their arms quietly aside, and they sleep. We share. It's an image that works wonderfully. It works because he takes himself up, and what he does is float over America and looks down and sees the people in their beds. A wonderful poem. I wander all night in my vision, stepping with light feet, swiftly and noiselessly stepping and stopping, bending with open eyes over the shut eyes of sleepers, wandering and confused, lost to myself, ill-assorted, contradictory, pausing, gazing, <coughs> bending and stopping, how solemn they look there, stretched and still. How quiet they breathe, and the children and their friends. He starts off by saying, I'm not very comfortable with life. I have to go and take a look at what people are doing. And he peers, peers. By the time it's over, he's come to some, some comfort in the, the consequence of this. Very nice poem. Extremely strange poem to read. Um, so I recommend that to you also as a poem well worth the reading. But that is not our job today. Our job is to read Song of Myself. I put on the board one of the uh, breakdowns of Song of Myself. This is James E. Miller's breakdown of the poem in an attempt to give it some shape or form. It's the one I tend to use as a teacher. It's not the only one. There are others as well. What I did last week was try to take us into what I told you was going to be, for our purposes, called uh, the inverted mystical state that the poet enters. So we read through our clock in section five. These are section numbers. What he's doing is trying to give us a sense of the, the incredibly difficult to perceive overall shape of the poem, uh, which is there in spite of the fact that it's 52 sections long. And you'll see what he does that it show us through his language that for the next section, section six and 16, the poet is, to, is going to try to alert himself to the human condition, right? that is, wakening himself up. Uh, you could call it sensitizing yourself in some ways. Section 17 to 32 is a purification process where he makes himself open to the experience, the way a mystic would purify himself from his uh, limitations, narrownesses, his evil. The consequence of all of this is going to be, in the, cent in the central part of the poem, what Miller calls the illumination in the dark night of the soul. And in mystical terms, this is when the mystic finally reaches his perception. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. He finally sees what is meant by all of this. He gets his contact with God. But with Whitman, it also includes a full understanding of, of misery and evil and the temptation to perceive evil as, as what lasts. not going to be possible for us to stay there, but it's awful tempting to perceive it like that. Once he breaks through this, he has two sections which deal with 
the consequence of the illumination, which is a, 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 an incredible union with nature and with God and with humanity, the sense of I'm finally in touch. And these, all these sections here deal with that bringing together to the various means of, of connection that we see. The section that the poem ends with an emergence into a sort of normal state where he releases us. If you want to jot that down, you'll find it uh, helpful as you read the poem uh, to uh, come to terms with it. So let's turn now to section section six, where we were when the bell rang. Uh, two weeks, sorry, when the clock rang. Now, a week ago, <laughs> academic language. Section five is the section we got to where we saw him making that entry, right? He has a, a kind of spiritual union with himself, his body and his soul. And section six begins, and any time you see leaves mentioned in this poem, it means something is happening, there's a change, a transition going on, with a crucial question. If you can answer the question to that, the answer, if you can answer that question that that child brings, what is grass, then you have the secret to the universe. You can answer one simple question, but it's not simple. I'll give you a clue also. The, the answer to that question paradoxically, cannot be given in words. And that's what the poet's problem is. The poet deals with words. But the answer to the question can only be perceived through experience. It has to do with the nature of God. And there is a particular line at the end of the poem that shows you the direction you must go to understand how God imbues himself in the world. But the words themselves will not suffice because any word limits. It doesn't suffice. It's not only love. He says it's love, it's plan, it's order, it's beauty. It's a crucial problem because words will not suffice, but they're the only way we have to express as a poet. So at the end of the poem, when you come to the section where he says, have I talked enough, right? You say, yeah, you've talked enough. And he says, but I haven't said anything at all. <laughs> he says, I've hardly got there. A child said, what is grass? fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? All of you know what he's talking about, because anyone who has a child or has been around small children knows that they have this tendency to ask unanswerable questions. Daddy, why is the sky blue? You can't say it's blue because of certain refractory principles. They don't, uh, they don't affect a five-year-old, right? You know, you know why. Tell me why the sky is blue, right? Tell me why because God made you, right? That's all you can say. That is, you can't communicate something, that you can't communicate in scientific principles a question which wants you to answer something beyond science. And the, the child is asking this, what is grass? How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. So he, he answers the question with some speculations. And each of these is to indicate the direction he wants us to go. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition out of hopeful green stuff woven. His, his sort of facetious answer here is, well, it's a symbol of me, right? I, that's my flag. I am happy and green and alive. But then he gets more serious, or I guess it must. it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer, designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say, whose? I can't read this without thinking of uh, Iago, that miserable wretch of a man. <laughs> but Whitman is not thinking about Iago here. But this, the point is, he says, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped. The key word is designedly. What does that mean? Deliberately dropped. Like Iago deliberately puts that handkerchief where it doesn't belong, right? And uh, that means that God puts it there for a purpose. And the purpose is that we see it lying, and we pick it up, and we say, whose handkerchief is this? But he's talking, you see, about one blade of grass. The point is that God's present in the meanest of creations. The commonest of all creations is grass. But if you look at that blade of grass, you will see G-O-D written down at the bottom. And the handkerchief that's scented with the initials is a special handkerchief. Right? It's not just the run of the mill. God is here in all elements. I think maybe that's what it is. Or, I guess the grass is itself a child, 
the produced babe of the vegetation, okay? that is nature creating and recreating itself to the child. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white, Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman, Cuff, and I give them the same. I receive them the same. Can you make some sense of that? What is he saying here? What does nature do for us? It equal, yeah, absolutely, right? Nature says, I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're an Indian or an Eskimo or a Canadian or a congressman, right? Is that right? Mark Twain says there's no Native American criminal class except Congress, right? So, so, even, so even, even the congressman is given this gift by nature. And now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair and graves. Tenderly will I use you, curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be if I had known them, I would have loved them. It may be you are from old people, or from offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps. And here you are in the mother's laps. At the end of the poem, Whitman is going to say, you look for me, you want to know where I am? Look underneath your feet. Right? I'm under your boot soles. But Whitman can't imagine in the long run anything finer than going into the ground and coming up as grass or flowers. Right? I'm sure that if you, if you asked him, how would you like to be embalmed and put in a nice concrete bunker, you know, kept in a pyramid someplace, he would say, oh, God forbid, I'm on my molecules to keep on living. Right? As much as these, people, these are the people we have. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. You hear the wonder in that? Transformation, metamorphosis, right? And yet there it is. How do the, how do the old white hairs, how do the little red mouths create this green grove? Oh, I perceive after all so many uttering tongues. And I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women, and the hints about old men and mothers and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men? What do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death, and if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and cease the moment life appeared. All goes on, onward and outward. Nothing collapses. And to die is different from what anyone supposed. Luckier. Uh, is he a religious person or not? Of course he is. Right? You can't write those words without seeing some intense religious value and perception in, in what life is about, what nature is about. So he's going to talk a little bit about death. You all think it's awful, right? Remember when I told you about Bryant, right? that oak piercing your mold? The kids really get excited about Poe because he's so, right, and soft, and the worms about her creep and all that stuff, see? But Whitman says, none of them, right? Hey, this is, this is part of life. Dying is part of life. Has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him it's just as lucky to die. And I know it. I pass death with the dying and birth with the new wash babe and am not contained between my hat and boots and pursue and peruse manifold objects, no two alike and everyone good, the earth good and the stars good and their adjuncts, all good. You see, the, the central thesis of Whitman is that none of this can be evil because the central principle of life is goodness. Um, in, the, in the high school terminology, uh, they, they, take, they say to kids, God doesn't make junk. Right? You've probably heard that phrase. It's in modern uh, sociologies where you're trying to convince children that they are of value. And that if you're created, you're good. Well, you don't have to use words quite as crass as that to see what, what Whitman is saying is the same thing. Right? That is, if it is part of the necessary round or circle of existence, it must be good. I am not an earth nor an adjunct of an earth. I am the mate and companion of all people, all just as immortal and fathomless as, my, fathomless as myself. 
So he says, if all these things are true, I want to find out what it is to be human. And with section 8, he's going to start looking at humanity. Can you see why he's going to do it? Because he believes he must accept all of that in order to understand the human condition. All of us are, are attached. And so section 8 begins this survey, which is going to take him around America and around the world, but especially America. He becomes an omniscient witness. Here he is observing. Shortly you'll see him taking it in and identifying with it. But right now he's looking to see what it is that we make up. The little one sleeps in its cradle. I lift the gauze and look a long time and silently brush away flies with my hand. But do you, can you see anything in attitude about that image? What attitude do you get? Well, how do you know the tenderness? Okay, he gives us an action, right? What is he doing, first of all? This is 19th century, and the babies were underneath, right, underneath the gauze to prevent the flies from getting out while they slept. But what's he doing? Okay, he's pulling up. And by pulling that up, it makes the baby open to the flies. What's the, the image, the word that he uses, the verb? That? No, for him. Lips and looks. Yeah. That is, notice the neutrality of that word, right? But what is he seeing? We're not, we're not sure what he's seeing. What we see is him trying to take the meaning of that child into himself. But also there's caring, too. Right? Keeps those flies away. So we start with the infant lying there in its innocence and youth. The youngster and the red-faced girl turn aside up the bushy hill. I peeringly view them from the top. Right? Here we are with the teenagers, right? Uh, what's his attitude here? What's the key verb here? You. No, the, the, the strong one, the one that gives him power. You. You. Did I say verb? I'm sorry. The, uh, You're the peering. peering, sure. Peering is the word that, what do you do when you see two uh, Youngsters going up. Why are they turning aside as they go up the hill? And why is she red-faced? Oh, she thinks right. she's a dirty old man. And she's looking forward to it, isn't she? <laughs> yes. Right? Yes, these kids have something planned. And so they're going up behind the bushes. You, see, you notice what, what something right up. Whitman can give you a whole story with one image. Right? You know where they're coming from. You know what they're going to do. You know how she feels about it. And what does the poet do? Peering. Of course. And what is peering? <laughs> is, it, is it stronger than looking? Sure. Yeah. Is it something more interesting than looking at a sleeping baby? Sure. In other words, he, where is he? Up above. He says, wow. Right? So baby, youngsters about their animal activities. The suicide sprawls in the bloody floor of the bedroom. I witness the corpse with its dabbled hair. I note where the pistol has fallen. What's the key word here? The verb. Oh, you see what's happening? He's saying, I'm going to look at all of these, the innocence, the love, or the lust, whatever it is, the death. I'm going to look that in its face. Witness means to note, to jot down, right? To see it, to perceive it, as though he were uh, having to testify in a court case. The blab of the paved, tires of carts, slough of boot soles, talk of the promenaders, the heavy omnibus. The driver. He's going to scan over. Whitman is, is beginning here. And he's going to have a lengthy uh, offering to you in the poem. Uh, what what he created for American poetry, which is the modern version of the catalog that comes out of Greek poetry. A catalog is, a, is a, an extended list of items, none of which is expanded very far, to uh, to create a certain effect. And he's the master of the catalog in American literature. Uh, we'll come to an example of that in a bit. In a bit. Let's turn uh, to section nine. At the end of section eight, he's already touched on a few items, and he's looked at these things, and you notice how it ends. He says, uh, arrests of criminals, slights, adulterous offers made, acceptances, rejections with convex lips. I like that. What's a rejection with a convex lip? What does he see? Someone is making an adulterous offer. Will you go to bed with me tonight? And she says, he says, I see all this, right? I mind them or the show, or the resonance of them, I come, I depart. You notice what's happening at the end of that? Section 8. No evaluative response. Right? 
He's not saying that. Oh, good fellow with his dirty offer, right? Those kids up there in the hill, they ought to be taken care of. That suicide, what a mortal sin. You know, none of that's there. He's saying, I want to see what human life is. I mind them, take note of them, and I go on. And we get some wonderful short passages dealing with America going about its business. Section 9 is two stanzas dealing with a country, uh, a country harvest scene. It's, it's some, some of these sections stand beautifully on their own as poetry. The big doors of the country barns stand open and ready. The dried grass of the harvest time loads the slow-drawn wagon. The clear light plays in the brown and green intertinged. The armfuls are packed to the sagging bow. I am there. I help. I came stretched atop the load. I felt its soft jolts. One leg reclined on the other. I jumped from the cross beams and seized the clover and Timothy and rolled head over heels and tangled my hair full of wisps. And probably some of you have done that, I imagine, <laughs> in years gone past. He say, I want to participate in what it is to be American. And first thing he offers us is two stanzas of one of the most wonderful times in the farm year. Right? Getting out there when, the, when the, it's coming in, don't have to worry about the hailstorms. Right? Wagons loaded. Section 10 is a compressed sequence of American scenes. It deals with hunting and with sailing and with New England and with the far west. And it, it is a, a, a section that says, here I am. I'm taking all of you. Okay. So it starts out with alone, far in the wilds and mountains. I hunt, wandering, amazed at my own lightness and glee. You hear the attitude? Almost as though he's floating. Six, uh, line 180. The Yankee clipper is under her sky sails. She cuts the sparkle and scud. My eyes settle the land. I bend at her prow or short shout joyously from the deck. Two lines, that's all you get. But you know what he's doing. Right? You can feel it. The boatmen and clam diggers arose early and stopped for me. I tucked my trouser ends in my boots and went and had a good time. You should have been with us that day round the chowder kettle. Don't you wish you were there? <laughs> they think, oh well, boy, what are the things you want to do, you see? I'd like to get out on the Yankee Clipper and sail in the breeze, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to be picked up at 6 o'clock in the morning in, in uh, Massachusetts to go out there and put your, right, stick your pants in those, rub in those big rubber boots and go out there and dig out those clams? And, and at night, it's like something out of Carousel, remember? Right? They have the big, it was a real nice clam bake. <laughs> boy, what a good time you have. And then he slips from Massachusetts or, or New England all the way out to the far west. I saw the marriage of the trapper in the open air in the far west. The bride was a red girl. Her father and his friends sat cross-legged and dumbly smoking. They had moccasins to their feet and large, thick blankets hanging from their shoulders. On a bank lounged the trapper. He was dressed mostly in skins. His luxuriant beard and curls protected his neck. He held his bride by the hand. She had long eyelashes. Her neck was bare. Her coarse, straight locks descended upon her voluptuous limbs and reached to her feet. Now, if you're reading it, what is the what phrase or, 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 or clause gives you the key to the whole episode? Right? Here's this man with his you know, trapper, filled with muscles. She's an Indian. I mean, how alien can you get, right? He's got these, this great, big, curly beard. The Indians are sitting around. But there's a line that tells you something. What is it? Absolutely. Right? What does it mean if you look at it? Why is he? He held his bride by the hand. Even if you're a trapper marrying an Indian in the far west, thousands of miles from civilization, do you love the woman you marry? Do you hold her tenderly by the hand? Sure you do. So Whitman can see the innate humanity in these people who are so alien to us that you'd say, of course I want to go on a clam bake, right? We know how educated and civilized New Englanders are, but do you want to be out there where the trapper marries the Indian girl? <coughs> no. And then something even more shocking, if you can think about when this was written in 1855, before the Civil War. The runaway slave came to my house and stopped outside. I heard his motions crackling the twigs of the woodpile. Through the swung half door of the kitchen, I saw him, limpsy and weak, and went where he sat on a log, and led him in and assured him, and brought water and filled a tub for his sweated body and bruised feet, 
and gave him a room that entered from my own and gave him some coarse, clean clothes and remember perfectly well his revolving eyes and his awkwardness and remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles. He stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. I had him sit next to me at the table. <coughs> My firelock leaned in the corner. Why is he telling us that? Okay, it's in simple. It's, it's, okay, a couple of things going on. What's he doing in <coughs> simple terms? He's acting as part of the Underground Railroad. Right? Uh, but into his house comes this man, right? If he's a man, or is he an animal? Uh, what indications are that he's different? He's black. He's covered with his wounds. Awkwardness. He's awkward. He walks, yes, the revolving eyes especially. Can you imagine what that black feels like? He's in a civilized house of a white northern, and his eyes are, right, his eyes are going like this. He's so frightened. Wouldn't you be frightened of somebody like that if you had one in your house? Whitman says, I brought him in. I filled the tub for his sweated body and bruised feet. You should catch echoes of Christ here, right? You should. If you do it to the least of these, right, you do it to me. He says, I gave him a room that entered from my own. Why tell us? You can always ask in a poem, why does he tell us that? Why does he tell us that detail? Because it shows how vulnerable he would be to the danger. Sure. Also, he would be able to Sure, sure. I, you know, I would, sure, the garage. Right? Yeah, that's where you go. Not in my house, right? He says, but no, I put right there on the other side. Then he tells us that other detail, the same thing. I had him sit next to me at the table. No, no, you eat in the kitchen, I eat in the dining room. Right? My fire lock leaned in the corner, which is the ultimate point. The slave could grab that gun as fast as he could. Right? That is, instead of having it next to me, he says, I trust this man. I trust his humanity. And so it's a marvelous. And we get what is, for me, the most powerful poem in the in Song of Myself, section 11. I really love this. I think it's marvelous as it gets into, as well as any poem I've ever, I've ever read, what it means to be lonely. But now he's not going to be arcane. He's not a slave or a trapper. It's an ordinary, white, upper middle class woman who's lonely. I'll read it through, and then we'll talk a little bit about what happens here. Twenty-eight young men bathe by the shore. Twenty-eight young men, and all so friendly. Twenty-eight years of womanly life, and all so lonesome. She owns the fine house by the rise of the bank. She hides handsome and richly dressed aft the blinds <coughs> of the window. <coughs> Which of the young men does she like the best? Ah, the homeliest of them beautiful to her. Where are you off to, lady? For I see you. You splash in the water there, yet stay stock still. Mm -hmm. Dancing and laughing along the beach came the 29th bather. The rest did not see her, but she saw them and loved them. The beards of the young men glistened with wet and ran from their long hair. Little streams passed all over their bodies seen hand also passed over their bodies. They descended primarily from their temples and ribs. The young men float on their backs, their white bellies bulge to the sun. They do not ask who seizes fast to them. They do not know who puffs and declines with pendant and bending arch. They do not think who may salvage and spray. You see, obviously, that's a poem all by itself. You don't have to have the whole to understand which, what it's about. It's, a, it's really a marvelous poem of, of need, right, of loneliness and isolation. It's a, it has, there, there are three things going on in the poem, uh, maybe even four if you want to include us. There are the men out there who are swimming in the beach. There is the woman behind the, the curtain peeking out from her well-appointed house. And then there is us and Whitman, who, who is watching her yearning for the physical companionship of these men. That's at, to the, at this point right now, at the end of 16, 
where he's uh, going to pull this together with a sort of statement. As a consequence of all the, the seeing, okay? Instead of I look, I look. The key difference here is in the, is in the, you know, the small word, I am of the old and young. Of the foolish as much as the wise. That is, he is now of them. He's not just watching them or taking them in. He's become part of them. Regardless of others, ever regardful of others. All of these things is what he is. At the end of section 16, a novice beginning yet experienced of myriads of seasons, of every hue and cast am I, of every rank and religion, a farmer, mechanic, artist, gentleman, sailor, Quaker, prisoner, fancy man, rowdy, lawyer, physician, priest. I resist anything better than my own diversity. Breathe the air, but leave plenty after me, and I'm not stuck up, and I'm in my place. He's well aware, by the way, that he's going to be accused for all eternity of being an egotist, right? <laughs> but he's telling you right here, he says, hey, I am not stuck up. If you perceive yourself right, you can't call this egotism, because that's unwarranted expansion of self, right? But this is, no, I'm not, I'm not stuck up at all. I'm right where I belong. I'm in my place. The moth and the fish eggs are in their place. The bright suns I see and the dark suns I cannot see are in their place. The palpable is in its place, and the impalpable is in its place. God's in his heaven, right? All is right with the world. Everything's made just the way it's supposed to be. Okay, we're down here at section 17, purification of self. 17 through 32 is going to, as the purification of self here means getting rid of what, what Emerson called mean egotism, right? narrow self. It's opening himself up to other selves. The theme for this section, if you want to put a one word to tie it together, is equality. And he is going to be equal to these various experiences. These are really the thoughts of all men in all ages and lands. They are not original with me. When the these he's referring to is what he's learned in this section about all these people, but we are of all of these. He's saying, I take no credit for this. Right? It's anybody who knows what it is to be human knows the truth of what we've just read. And if you don't perceive it yourself, you haven't read it right. Go back and read it again, he would say. If they are not yours as much as mine, they are nothing, or next to nothing. He's meaning, I'm not trying to convince you against your will. Don't, don't tell me, uh, tell me some more. I'm not quite, not quite convinced. He says, if you don't understand what I was saying, if they're not yours from your interior, then it's useless talking to you because you have to see the truth of this on your own. If they are not the riddle and the untying of the riddle, what's the riddle? Um, put it in the language of the poem. What's the riddle? But, of course, in broader terms, what is life? What does it mean to be alive and to be human? They're nothing. If they are not just as close as they are distant, they are nothing. And here's that clue we were in a transition, you see. This is the grass that grows wherever the land is and the water is. This is the calm air that bathes the globe. So section 18 is going to bring us some sort of trumpets. Here we come, all these wonderful things. He has music, even for the defeated. With music strong I come, with cornets and my drums. I play marches, for not for accepted victors only. I play marches for conquered and slain persons. Remember Dickens' poem? But and who knows success is only counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. Comprehend the nectar requires sorest need, right? Who, who knows what victory is? The yeah. defeated, dying, right? Who's lying there, not the guy out there with the purple, the purple cloak. All of these things. Have you heard it was good to gain the day? I also say it is good to fall. Battles are lost in the same spirit in which they are won. I beat and pound for the dead. I blow through my embouchures, my loudest and gayest for them. Are battles lost in the same spirit in which they are won? Sure, sure, of course. Embouchure is the term for your, your lips. You play the clarinet like I do, you have to get a strong embouchure. It's the muscles around you. Viva is to those who have failed. Anti-American, right? We don't like the <laughs> we don't like the losers. 
and to those whose war vessels sank in the sea, and to those themselves who sank in the sea, and to all generals that lost engagements, and all overcome heroes, and the numberless unknown heroes equal to the greatest heroes known. He's being funny here, by the way. He's trying to, there's a, look for the, the humor. Don't read it with, with a completely closed, dour mind. And he's aware of the amusement here. He says, e this is, right? I, all of these things are of equal value. This is the meal equally set. This is the meat for natural hunger. This is the press of a bashful hand. He says, do you think I have a reason for doing this? Okay. Why am I doing this? You guess I have some intricate purpose. Well, I have. For the fourth month, showers have. And the mica on the side of the rock has. You take it, I would astonish. Does the daylight astonish? Does the early red start twittering through the woods? Do I astonish more than they? This thing, I tell, this, this hour I tell things in confidence. I might not tell everybody. I will tell you. Yeah, to anybody who wants to read. He wants very much for you as a reader to get very close to him. It's a one-on-one. -on -one. You're my friend. I will tell you something. Does, this, does the bird in the morning Robin that sings in, in our hawthorn tree. Every morning when I leave the game, I look for it. It's just Robin up there singing away. Why is he always up there? What's he doing? <laughs> right? It's astonishing when you think that he has, it's, and he's come for about three years in a row. All right. I don't understand that bird. So here he is, all right? Who is he? Who goes there? Hankering, gross, mystical, nude. <laughs> All the uh, very dainty readers are going to say, oh, gee whiz, you know, what's he doing? Is this man coming up here hankering, yearning for things? Is he nude? It, actually naked? How is it I extract strength from the beef I eat? <laughs> How does that come about, right? Hamburger today, strength tomorrow. It's a mystery of the universe, see? Well, how does that come about? That your Big Mac turns into, right? How does this happen? What is a man, anyhow? What am I? What are you? All I mark as my own, you shall offset it with your own. Thus it were time, lost, listening to me. You see what he's doing? This is a Thoreau, by the way, as well, isn't it? You better find the equivalent for yourself of what I'm saying. But come on with me to Walden, and we'll see what it's like to find out what it is to live without all kinds of extra bag and baggage. He doesn't mean that you have to go up to Alaska and put up a shack. He does mean you should go through the same exploration of self that Whitman is asking you to do here. Which is okay. When I set something off and say, this is me, you find the equivalent in your life. And see how it feels. I do not snivel that snivel the world over. I love words like snivel and gross. <laughs> He's so unpoetic, right? The months are vacuums in the ground that wallow and filth. Whim whimpering and truckling fold with powders for invalids. Conformity goes to the fourth remove. I wear my hat indoors. As I please, indoors or out. <laughs> That's always fun to do this to students, the young kids. I say, what does that mean? I wear my hat. What's a hat? They say, right? <laughs> Don't you understand that? Right? <laughs> gentlemen, what does a gentleman not do? Wear it indoors. Right? When you walk in, right? You take your hat off, and then you see a lady. He's, this is very much in the tradition of gentlemanly customs. But Whitman says, hey, right? I feel like wearing a hat. I wear a hat. I had a boy come in last week wearing a great big black western hat he came in and I thought, boy, is that ever neat? Is he going to wear that hat in my classroom? <laughs> and I was just waiting to jump on him and he took it off. If he wanted to wear it, he came in late so I could to see his hat. And I was just ready to say, Teal, that hat goes off. Then I thought afterwards, oh boy, you're doing Whitman and then you go take your hat off. <laughs> I wear a vest when I'm teaching Whitman too. See, isn't that terrible? I wear my hat as I please, indoors or out. Now, he's saying you should feel the equivalent in you, right? Don't you have those times when you say, hey, today, shorts, right? Varicose veins, I don't care, right? Shorts. Why should I pray? Why should I venerate and be ceremonious? Having pried through the strata, analyzed to a hair, counseled with doctors and calculated close, I find no sweeter fat sticks to my own <laughs> <laughs> right? 
You have to have pride in yourself. And Whitman believes this very strongly. This is that, hey, when I get done going to college, right, medical school, I say, this is it. Right? This is as good as there is. In all people I see myself, none more and not a barley corn less. And the good or bad I say of myself, I say of them. I know I am solid and sound. To me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. All are written to me. I must get what the right. See, if you if you don't believe that it's for you, then there's no other way you're going to get any kind of importance in life whatsoever. Because you're not going to be somebody else. If you think all the world and the universe is structured for him, right? You've missed the mark entirely because you're the only person you will ever be. And if you think, oh dear, you know, I'm not quite smart enough, or I'm not quite beautiful enough, or I'm not quite educated enough, uh, I'm just sort of a sideshow in the universe, you're missing the whole point of the universe. Because the only perspective you will ever get is that of your own soul and your own body and your own time in your own nation, and you better think that you are the heart and soul of it if you want to have anything in life at all. I know I am deathless. I know this orbit of mine cannot be swept by a carpenter's compass. I know I shall not pass like a child's carlicue cut with a burnt stick in night. I exist as I am. That is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. One world is aware and by far the largest to me, and that is myself. And whether I come to my own today or in 10,000 or 10 million years, I can cheerfully take it now, or with equal cheerfulness, I can wait. Dickinson said, if, uh, if I'm going to be famous, there's nothing I can do to avoid it. If I'm not, there's nothing I can do that will get it from me. But I think I will do. And she waited to long after she was dead to get what she knew she had coming, and that is her position as a poet in America. She didn't need to be published, you see, for her to know who she was. That security that she called that columnar self, having it inside of you, knowing who you are, was enough for her. So 21 is bringing all of us together. It's going to say, all right, I am the poet of the body, and I am the poet of the soul. The pleasures of heaven are with me, and the pains of hell are with me. I take all of this. Not only the, not, you don't, you're not going to say, I will take the pleasures of, hell, of heaven. He can have the pain of hell. <laughs> right? No, you can't have that. You have to take both sides. The first I graft and increase upon myself. The latter I translate into a new tongue. He's going to be, have some very Christ-oriented experiences as it goes on. Because he's going to, in a sense, go through the Christ experience of mortification and death see it as a, as a very vividly. Christ did not say, I come here to be happy. He came here for pain and translated it into new meaning, which is what Whitman is trying to offer us as a poetic experience. So he goes on to say some of these very weird things in the 19th century, which really put him out in left field. I am the poet of the woman the same as the man. And it, I say it is as great to be a woman as to be a man. He's a certified nutcase, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody in the 19th century believed that. And I say there is nothing greater than the mother of man. I chant the chant of dilation or pride. Have you outstripped the rest, eh, Mr. Reagan? Eh? Are you the president? It is a trifle. They will more than arrive there, every one, and still pass on. I am he that walks with the tender and growing night. I call to the earth and sea, and have held by the night. So he goes on and gives a peroration to, to night and then to earth. Section 22, we're going to skim over some things now. He uh, speaks to the sea. You see, I resign myself to you also. I guess what you mean. We'll skip over that. I am not, end of that, uh, that section there, I am not the poet of goodness only. I do not decline to be the poet of wickedness also. What blurt is this about virtue and about vice? See where I am? What page? 66. Evil propels me. And reform of evil propels me. I stand indifferent. My gate is no fault finder's or rejecter's gate. I moisten the roots of all that has grown. People are going to accuse him of not, of not being aware of evil, but what he's going to say is that what you must do is take it, 
come to terms with it and expand it to give it meaning in its broader sense. We'll see what happens as time passes. Go over that. Section 23, focus on time. I wish I would go through the whole thing, but we don't. We only have so much time ourselves. Here or henceforward, it is all the same to me. I accept time absolutely. Keep turning over. Um, about um, in section 24. Find that? Okay. Walt Whitman. A reminder that there's an individual speaking, a cosmos of Manhattan, the sun. Turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breathing. He didn't do any breathing as far as we know, but for the sake of the poem, it's something we must see. This is that acceptance of the self and the body. No sentimentalist, no stander above men and women or apart from them. No more modest than immodest. Unscrew the locks from the doors. Unscrew the doors themselves from the jams. <laughs> I like that line too. Why is he saying that, do you suppose? All right. Uh, yes, okay. First you take the locks off the doors, then he says, wait a minute, that's not enough because you can shut the doors, right? No, we want the doors open. So we take the locks off, then we take the doors off the jams, let it come in, whatever it is. Whoever degrades another degrades me. And whatever is done or said returns to me at last. Through me, the afflatus, that's the spirit of life, right? Surging and surging through me, the current and index. I speak the sign, the password from evil. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. Whitman is the most democratic of all poets allows for no differentiation in terms of value of human soul, as you can see. Takes it all. Through me, forbidden voices, voices of sexes and lusts, voices veiled. I remove the veil. Voices indecent, by me clarified, transfigured. I do not press my fingers across my mouth. What does that mean? No, it's more than one finger. It's fingers. It's not quite, no, it's not that. It's, what, what's the image? What's the image? What's the image? Yeah, shock, shock, right? It's a shock image, not quietness, but, oh, look what he did, right? Oh, did you hear about him? You know, oh my gosh, that is, I don't try to, I, I do not press my fingers across my mouth. I keep as delicate around the bowels as around the head and heart. Even there, I mean, my gosh, is he willing to, put nothing aside is distasteful? No, not, not if it's natural, see? Copulation is no more rank to me than death is. I believe in the flesh and the appetite. Seeing, hearing, feeling are miracles, and each part and tag of me is a miracle. Divine am I, inside and out, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched upon, touched from. The scent of these armpits, aroma finer than prayer. This is where the students always go. If you have these sort of responsive classes, they start going, oh, gee, Mr. Colbert, oh, how can you say that? You know, they, don't, they don't believe it. Right? They do not believe that he can believe himself, that he says, and we are all so thoroughly deodorized, right, that <laughs> if you get anything like the natural odor, does he believe it? Yes. yes, he does. Yes, he does. There's nothing wrong with that. Finer than prayer, though, I don't know. The head more than churches, Bibles, and, and all creeds. All of those things are creations, you see, churches and Bibles. What's holy is the head, the human, the human temple here. If I worship one thing more than another, it shall be the spread of my own body, or any part of it, translucent mold of me, it shall be you. It means you gain 10 pounds, you should be Absolutely right. <laughs> Every ounce. <laughs> Show, shaded ledges and rest, it shall be you. He goes on through his whole, he speaks about several parts of his body here, his beard, his hair, his uh, hair, the vapors, and it's the next stanza. Hands I have taken, face I have kissed, mortal I have ever touched, it shall be you. I dote on myself. There is that lot of me, and all so luscious. <laughs> 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 Wonderful lines. Each moment and whatever happens thrills me with joy. I cannot tell how my ankles bend nor whence the cause of my faintest wish, nor the cause of the friendship I emit, nor the cause of the friendship I take again. Um, there's one of my favorite images there. And that's, uh, 
I like I dote on myself. I like the humor of that. But look at the seriousness of something as simple as, I cannot tell how my uncle's name. How does that happen? Look at your ankles. Look at the joints that you're made to have there as you put these. See, if you can answer that question, you've got it, right? That, that mystery, that miracle, of course you should dote on it. How your wrist turns on the end of your arm. You can pick these things up. I mean, watch a monkey that doesn't have opposing fingers try to do things, and we can do anything we want. And Whitman says, if you know that, you've got the secret of the universe. And nor the cause of the friendship I emit. The key word there, the odd word, emit. emit. Sure. What does emit? He says, when I walk through life, and apparently he was like that. Everything I've read about him as a human is that when you walked up, he just... Nice, glad to meet you. The great big paw of a hand would come out. He'd shake your hand and sit down and have a beer. There's a certain sort of healthy radiance of friendship and, and ease. You uh, very see that in his face. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a wonderful face. Open and warm and, and weird. And funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He does have a fascinating face. You know very well he wouldn't be a shy man in the corner, though, with that face. Not shy, no. He did sit in the corner, though. But that was a, as the observer. Yeah, so people would come to him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, let's go on so you can find a few more. Section 25. If you feel its way about yourself, dazzling and tremendous, how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send sunrise out of me. You must uh, be reminded of Melville in uh, Ahab saying, if the sun can strike me, right, why I can strike the sun that sense of opposition, right? For him, I, I am human. I can be insulted. And if you insult me, I can insult you back. I don't care who it is. If it's a way or not. Just the direct opposite, right? Whitman mm -hmm. says, oh, what? I would die with the glory of that sun unless I had an equivalent sun inside of me to meet it. Right? Otherwise, I would just be burned to a crisp. We also ascend dazzling and tremendous as the sun. We found our own, oh, my soul, in the calm and cool of the daybreak. Nice stuff. Turn over. End of that uh, stanza. I'm sorry, I didn't mean turn over. I was turning over. <laughs> Speech is the twin of my vision. It is unequal to measure itself. It provokes me forever. It says sarcastically, Walt, you contain enough. Why don't you let it out then? Is that normal language? I might mention it with a language like that. That Walt uh, Whitman is one of the precursors of Mark Twain in terms of language. This is the motion in 19th century American literature towards the natural dialect of Americans. Shocking to people who've been reading the, the elegance of, of Lowell and Holmes and, and the Longfellow and the, the uh, Brahmins of Boston at the time. So on section 26, after he's made these claims, he says, all in the process of equality, my body is equal, right? I'm, a, I'm able to match this world around me. He says, I'm, in section 26, I'm going to stop and listen for a while. He's going to play a little a little uh, interlude here in which he uses some of our senses, the way we take in experience around us. So he says, now I will do nothing but listen to approve what I hear into this song, to let sounds contribute toward it. I hear bravura of birds, bustle of growing wheat, gossip of flames, clack of sticks cooking my meals. I hear the sound I love, the sound of the human voice. I hear all sounds running together, combined, fused, or flowing. But you go on, you get a catalog here, a short catalog of human sounds. <coughs> I hear the chorus. It is a grand opera. Oh, this indeed is music. This suits me. For all his oddity and his roughness, Whitman was a fanatic lover of opera. He went to every opera he could get, he could see. He loved Verdi in particular. But he had good taste in opera as well. And that's something I've had a hard time coming together. I don't know quite... He doesn't strike me as an opera type, but opera was his thing. A tenor large and fresh as the creation fills me. The orbic flex of his mouth is pouring and filling me full. I hear the trained soprano. What work with her is this? The orchestra whirls me wider than Uranus flies. It wrenches such ardors from me I did not know I possessed them. I guess that's a true opera lover speaking. He loses his breath in glory, he says, at that. Section 27. Something even more powerful is coming up. 
something stronger than seeing, and stronger than saying, and stronger than listening. Yes, if you know much Whitman, as you might imagine, the strongest of all human senses, which is touch, very dangerous. I merely stir, press, feel with my fingers, and I'm happy. To touch my person to someone else's is about as much as I can stand. And then section 28. Is this then a touch? Quivering me to a new identity. <coughs> Flames and ether making a rush for my veins. Treacherous tip of me reaching out and crowding to help them. On all sides, prurient provokers stiffening my limbs. It's almost as though you can't bear it because you want to touch people all the time. You want to reach out. And anytime I read this, I'm reminded of Winesburg, Ohio. Do you remember the story about uh, Wings? Wings Biddlebaum, who's destroyed because he's a man has to touch people and they, they say he's homosexual and so he's a teacher who's not allowed. And that's in it's a marvelous story by Anderson where he, Wings can't all every time he talks his hands want to touch like it's just, it's just like butterflies and when he reach out and touch them and he knows he better not do it. So all of his life is a matter of putting him in his pocket and like this. So he cannot do what he wants to do instinctively. Straining the udder of my heart for its withheld drip behaving licentious toward me, taking no denial, depriving me of my bestest for a purpose, unbuttoning my clothes, holding me by the bare waist, all these temptations, you see. When it gets, it becomes a strongly sexual ecstasy as the stanza goes on. The centuries desert every other part of me. My touch makes you lose control. This is psychologically true, by the way. Psychologists and psychiatrists have said, when you are aroused in this fashion, you do lose your other senses. You don't hear things. You don't smell things. The house burns down around you. The sentries desert every other part of me. They have left me helpless to a red marauder. They all come to the headland to witness and assist against me. I'm given up by traitors. I talk wildly. I've lost my wits. I and nobody else am the greatest traitor. I went myself first to the headland. My own hands carried me there. You villain touch. What are you doing? Breath is tight in its throat, and clench your floodgates are too much for me. Blind, loving, wrestling touch. The sheathed, hooded, sharp tooth touch. Did it make you ache so leaving me? Parting track by arriving. Section 20 pulls him away from that. All truths wait in all things. <laughs> they neither hasten their delivery nor resist it. Do not need the obstetric forceps of the surgeon. The insignificance is as big to me as any. What is more or less than the touch? So he, he's, he is very, very good at pace, emotional pace. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, study to, to read these poems and to watch where he tightens it up and he relaxes. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe says you can't write, read more than 100 lines without having a poem collapse because of we can't sustain the intense emotion that poetry demands. But he's wrong, of course, because what you can do is modulate, which is what Whitman and uh, someone like Milton does. Okay, we're at section 31. We're moving up to the end of this section. At the end of section 31, he says, nothing can escape him. Everything tries to run away, but he takes it all. In vain, they run away. And in 32, he comes around to one of my students' favorite sections. <laughs> I think I could turn and live with the animals. They're so placid and self-contained. I stand up and look at them and look at them. Long, long. You hear the double meaning of that? They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. So they show their relations to me. I accept them. They bring me tokens of myself. They evince them plainly in their possession. You hear no tokens, right? Remember that? Okay, the grass, the leaves. We're moving now to that transition moment. I wonder where they get those tokens. Did I pass that way huge times ago and negligently drop them? 
the gigantic beauty of a stallion, fresh and responsive to my caresses, head high in the forehead, wide between the ears, limbs glossy and supple, tail dusting the ground, eyes full of sparkling wickedness, ears finely cut, flexibly moving. His nostrils dilate as my heels embrace him. His well-built limbs tremble with pleasure as we race around and return. I but use you a minute, then I resign you, stallion. Why do I need your paces when I myself out gallop them, even if I, as I stand or sit, passing faster than you? See what nature offers him? This is a, well, I, I don't, this is human beings, right? They lie around. Oh, I'm so miserable. Oh, gee, you know, gosh, I wish I was out there doing no. Uh, they whine about their condition. They're sick about this. He says, just look at the animals around you. There's not an animal in the world that does any of these stupid things. They're not out to own things. And he focuses on one animal, right, this down. What is the animal? He's just being a horse, right? And he's beautiful being a horse. And you get on him and you say, this is what motion is like. This is what energy is like. Get off that horse. The animals are like everything else. They're representative of what we could be if we had ourselves right in our interiors, which we do not have. So, so most of us do not. But it's giving him a clue. And 33 brings him around. And he's going to start seeing what this means. The illumination of the dark night of the soul. It's a reference going back all the way to section 5. Space and time. Now I see it is true what I guessed at. What I guessed when I loafed on the, gra on the grass. What I guessed while I lay alone in my bed. And again, as I walked the beach under the paling stars of the morning. What was it he guessed? Remember what he said in section 5? Yes, and that what spirit imbues all nature and everything. God's love is there. Right? Section 5 is the, is the knowledge that underneath it all, Go right back. This is what he guessed at. Way right back in section five, he says, Swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know that the spirit of God is the brother of my own. And that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women my sisters and lovers. And that a Kelson the creation long. And it takes him 32 sections before what he knows up in his head, as a result of opening himself up to experience, he knows in his heart, right? Now he says, I know what it, what it meant. And you too, if you've gone through the experience, will see, he hopes, have the same feeling. And I think that, so for the first time in section 33, he imagines himself freed entirely from space and time. Up to this point, all of his encounters have been encounters in the mid-19th century. But now he's going to say, time isn't, doesn't restrict us. Right? God hasn't got us down in one time zone at all. If you have the right imaginative response, you can go anywhere. And he's going to go back in history. He's going to go all over the world. He's just going to be, as he says, a foot in my vision. My ties and ballasts leave me. See, the ties and ballasts are Walt Whitman, 38 years old, right? Here in New York to this country. He says, no, not that stuff. I'm free now of it. My elbows rest in sea gaps. I skirt sierras, my palms over continents. I am afoot with my vision. And 33 goes on. He imagines himself out and wham, you're in the midst of the, the massive middle section of the poem, which is a long catalog. I'll let you do on your own. <laughs> and it takes a little time to read it properly, but you'll notice you keep on turning pages. And you keep on turning pages. He visits all these things, goes everywhere. It's a very, very uh, important section. He uh, keep on going. Ultimately, she'll come upon. Oh, now let's see. Near the end of 33, among the things that he's taking onto himself, all of these, you find the section that starts. Agonies are one of my changes of garments. Find that. What page is that? Okay. He's brought. He's covered all of the world in this section at this point, and obviously it would take another uh, four weeks for us to do this line by line. One of the points he's getting at, though, is that he's got to now accept fully the pain that being alive puts on us as individuals. And once you've done that, you can translate it. Mm -hmm. 
can go through it and beyond it. Agonies are one of the changes in my garments. I do not ask the wounded person how he feels. I myself become the wounded person. My hurts turn livid upon me as I lean on a cane and observe. I am the mashed fireman with breastbone broken. Tumbling walls buried me in their debris. Heat and smoke I inspired as I breathed in. I heard the yelling shouts of my comrades. I heard the distant click of their picks and shovels. They have cleared the beams away. They tenderly lift me forth. I lie in the night air in my red shirt, the pervading hushes for my sake. Painless after all, I lie exhausted, but not so unhappy. White and beautiful are the faces around me. My heads are bare of their fire caps. The kneeling crowd fades with the light of the torches. I am an old artillerist. I tell of my fort's bombardment. I am there again. Again the long roll of drummers. Again the attacking cannon mortars. Again to my listening ears the cannon responsive. I hear all of these things, he says. And now section 34 is going to give us some stories. These are poems that are a lot like, in a comparable manner, the poem about the woman and the, and the, uh, the swimmers, because they stand very much on their own. Section 34 is uh, the Alamo. Right? It's similar to the Alamo. It's not the Alamo. A Tale of Texas. You can read it almost as a short story. Now I tell what I knew in Texas in my early youth. I do not tell the fall of the Alamo. Not one escaped to tell the fall of the Al Alamo. The 150 are dumb at Alamo. It is the tale of the murder in cold blood of 400 and 12 young men. Well, they're killed. So you can read that on your own. Bottom of that section. None obeyed the command to kneel. They were murdered. A youth not 17 years old seized his assassin till two more came to release him. The three were all torn and covered with the boy's blood. At 11 o'clock began the burning of the bodies. This is the tale of the murder. <coughs> 412 years ago. 35, telling me stories. Would you hear of an old time sea fight? Would you learn who won by the light of the moon and stars? Listen to this yarn as my grandmother's father, the sailor, told it to me. How far back has he gone to sea fight? Great grandfather who heard it, you'll, hear, you'll recognize this right away. Our foe was no skulk in his ship, I tell you, said he. See, these are stories about people dying, being heroic who are just as people, just as much people, because they did it and were alive 200 years ago, as we are today, who are trying to come to terms with human spirit. Fighting at sundown, fighting at the dark. Our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter, if our colors are struck and the fighting done. Oh, I laugh content for I hear the voice of my little captain. We have not struck, he composedly cries. We have just begun our part of the fighting. Now, you know where that's from, right? Mm -hmm. We have not yet begun to fight. Who is it? Yeah. Sure, everybody knows the story. But John Paul Jones is bouldering in his grave with John Brown, isn't he? Yeah? Sure. But you see what he's saying? This is heroic. It's also pain and agony. And it's important. It's important to all the same. But if you take the meaning of all this misery and, and heroism, you're likely to be damaged. It's a very dangerous experience. Section 36, we reach the, the depth of the poem. All these things, a few large stars overhead. See where I am? 940. We're at the end of section 36. Silent and mournful shining, delicate sniffs of sea breeze, Smells of sedgy grass and fields by the shore. Death messages given in charge to survivors. The hiss of the surgeon's knife. The gnawing teeth of his saw. Wheeze, cluck. Swash of falling blood. Short, wild scream and long, dull, tapering groan. These two so are irretrievable. You laggards, they're on guard. Look to your arms. Watch out, he says. I am in at the conquered door as they crowd. I am possessed. Embody all presence as myself. See it myself in prison, 
shaped like another man, and feel the dull, unintermitted pain. Not a youngster is taken for larceny, but I go up too, and am tried and sentenced. Not a cholera patient lies at the last gasp, but I also lie at the last gasp. My face is ash-colored, my sinews gnarl. Away from me people retreat. Askers embody themselves in me, and I am, am embodied in them. I project my hat, sit, shame-faced, big. This is the bottom. This is the dark night of the soul. He's, how low can you get, right? He's taken all this pain, all this grief and agony. He's identified with it so thoroughly that it's become life to him. And he's at the bottom. He's on his knees with his hat in his hand, alone, at the very bottom. Watch the danger. Section 38. I'm going to bring us out of it, right? With these last two sections. Enough! 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 Right? Watch out. There's a terrible temptation, he says, when you're trying to take this in. Somehow I have been stunned. Stand back. Give me a little time beyond my cuffed head. Slumbers, dreams, gaping. I discover myself on the verge of a usual mistake. What is that? Can you guess what the usual mistake is? Okay, despair because of what? Discouragement because of what? Why? Why? He feels too deeply. It's a consequence of the mistake, which is to make him, if you feel too deeply and make too close a connection, you're likely to believe that that's all there is. Right? Despair? Yeah, right? Yeah. You may not despair without, it's the unpardonable sin, right? Despairing of God's grace, you cannot do it. As soon as you do it, you're lost. But the temptation is always there because the more sensitive you are to the pain of others, the more likely you're to say, this is life, right? This is it, misery, pain, agony. Yes, you must somehow get that point. Wait a minute, this is not everything. Yes, I must take it, but I must not give in to it. And the rest of this section, is to, this, the poem is to get us out of the necessity of facing it really, and yet not tumbling over another literary comparison. It's what, in another way, happens in Heart of Darkness, if you know Conrad's great short story. Right? There are two people there. There's Kurtz and there's Marlowe, who go to the edge and look into the soul of man and see the potential evil there. And Kurtz is seduced by it, and he's destroyed by it. And Marlowe goes to the edge and says, you must go to the edge. You're not a human being, thoroughly, unless you do must also go back to that edge. And you must believe that you have in you the potential for all the evil that man has ever done. That you share in it. You think of the worst that's happened. You could do it. You could do it. Don't say only only Germans could be Nazis. Because that's not true. Right? Don't say that. You could be a Nazi too. Um, but what you must do is recognize that potential and go back and say, I choose not to do that. I choose not become blinded by the attraction of the evil, or in this case, the attraction of the pain. So he pulls back and says, this is the old mistake again, right? Taking what is momentary or part for the whole. The whole person, the whole reason for it is to see the whole. That I could forget the mockers and insults. That I could forget the trickling tears and blows of the bludgeons and hammers. That I could look with a separate look on my own crucifixion and bloody crowning. He's got to get out of that. Uh, Christ does that. You see, you can see the image, obviously. It's very... Uh, Christ had to forget those things, didn't he? Right? Christ, in order to, to be Christ, could not say, oh, well, they're mocking me, they're insulting me, look what they've done, I give up. Right? The that here means, oh, that I can. Right? Not that I did. But that if I could do this, then I can say, Father, forgive them they don't know what they're doing. If they could see in the broad view, they would know what they did. They don't know. That's the hard part.